I had jury duty on Friday. Can I get a little more groan than that, right? I, I've never, though, I'll be honest with you, I've never been in part of this sort of jury duty where you go in, you immediately get ushered into the courtroom, and you get picked, and I mean, it starts. I mean, it's a quick deal. I'd never been a part of that part before, and uh, was at the courthouse, and went in, went into this process, and and I'm thinking to myself, man, I really don't want to be here. And But there was like four people in the room was just salivating out of both sides of their mouth. They were so excited to be a part of this. They were hoping they were going to get picked. I was like, well, they're not going to get picked because nobody's going to pick them uh, because, you know, they're just a little too eager. Well, in this world of judicial, legal, law, lawyer, you know, John, you might know a little bit about this as well. In the midst of all of this, you get asked this question as a jury person. If you get picked to sit on the jury, how do you know if the person is telling Oh, you've been in jury duty too. <laughs> And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, because I'm a sociologist, and I'm a, I also understand a little bit about the judicial system, and I understand that, you know, we get ushered into this room, and we sit down in these seats, and we immediately stare eyeball to eyeball with the prosecutor and with the defendant who's representing themselves. And they're trying to figure out, of us 14, which of these six suckers can I pick that will agree with me? Is it really about the truth? Because I got asked the question, as they said, uh, Kelly, uh, we've not heard from you today. <laughs> How do you decide the truth? And I said, I don't know. You don't know? Not, not when it comes to this moment. I've got to get into this moment. But listen to me. If you want to know where all truth is, and I didn't say this, if you want to know where all truth in is, guess where? the Bible. It is God's Word. It is His Holy Word. And I just want you to know, as I celebrate today, a number of things. I have my UK cufflinks on today. That doesn't matter. But anyway, I'm two days away from reading the Bible a hundred times. And I am, you go, are you proud of that? I am. But James reminded me, Jesus' brother, reminded me just a few days ago, it ain't what you read, it's what you apply. It ain't what you read. We don't want God just to listen. We want him to respond, don't we? We don't want to just tell God and then not hear any response. We don't want him just to listen. We want him to respond. God doesn't want us just to read. He wants us to apply it. And what was happening in the first century is that the early church was not applying what they knew. And they were getting caught up in civil disputes and they were taking each other to court to take advantage of each other, to try and take each other's stuff, their money, away from them. Now, sometimes people say, well, the Bible just seems to be not very relevant. Well, I can assure you that what we're going to talk about today is extremely relevant. There is a whole chapter in the Bible dedicated to civil disputes, to people that were at odds with each other who claimed the name of Jesus, and yet they were using a secular court to take advantage of each other because they did not want to apply the truth that they already knew. And so today, I want to invite you to take your programs, to take your Bibles, to take your internet devices and open them. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. And while you find your place, I want to welcome those that are online. Uh, I want to give greetings. Uh, I, I don't know if Brother Jerry's sister, Tammy, uh, and his mother, Marty, I don't you all may be watching this morning. Uh, our brother Jerry Tolley at about 8.30 this morning uh, stepped into heaven. Amen. Can we give the man a hand? He, 
He is the envy of all of us who claim the name of Jesus. No more sorrow, no more suffering, no more imperfections, no more impurities. Jerry's home. And we will celebrate. Yeah, let's give him another hand. We will celebrate this man's life uh, this Saturday. Uh, More details will come, uh, but we just encourage you to pray for the family. I got to spend about two hours, uh, Tasha and I did, uh, along with Marty and Cindy Rauer, our elders, got to spend some time, about two hours on Monday with them, uh, got to talk to them. And I said to Jerry and I say to you, every one of us, will face the final enemy called death. Unless Jesus returns, okay? And let's hope he returns today. But unless he returns in our lifetime, every one of us are going to face death. And we do not face death because God doesn't love us. We face death because it is a consequence of the fallen nature of the world that we live in. And so I just want to encourage you I just want to encourage you to cling to the truth, to cling to the truth of God's word, that there is a hopeful, eternal future that awaits every man, woman, and child who claims the name of Jesus as their Messiah and as their Savior. Amen? Amen? And we're going to see somewhere between 12 and 16 people next Sunday. This house is going to be rocking, all right? And we are going to have a lot of fun. And I want to encourage you. One, uh, there's two converts that have already invited 37 people to come to be a part of next week. I want to encourage you, especially if you have unbelieving family and friends, next week is the week to invite them. Because you're going to hear the stories, the miraculous stories of how Christ takes our lives and changes us forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's jump in to verse 1 here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. When you have something against another Christian, now I know this never happens to you, but if you do, that's the context. Why do you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter. Instead of taking it to other Christians to decide who is right. Now, if you're anything like me and you read this first verse, you might step back because I myself have gone through a criminal case in my life due to my mother being killed by a drunk driver. This passage is not addressing criminal acts, okay? This passage is only addressing civil disputes that have to do with things like what Judge Judy deals with. She's a tough character now, let me tell you. Criminal issues are not a part of Romans chapter, or excuse me, of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But look at Romans 13.1. How do we deal with criminal acts? See, I could have said to the man who drove drunk and killed my mom, I could have said, hey, don't worry about it. But that does not keep the government from filing a criminal case against that individual. And so it is really important for you to understand that government exists for a reason. But sometimes we misuse government. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, obey the government. Now, do you remember when the government started? I'm not talking about the United States, okay? I'm talking about the Bible. The government started when God called Moses up onto the mountain and gave him the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the physical evidence of governmental institutional establishment upon the earth. One time in this country, you could not walk into a courtroom and not see the Ten Commandments on the wall because our country used to understand that that is what established government. Amen? Amen. And we're far from that now. 
We are wandering. We are fleeing. We are running from how government was established and why. God established the government. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The reason why it's called the Mosaic Law is because God gave Moses the law and God told Moses to give the people the law. And the law was established by God Almighty. So we are to obey the government. Why? For God is the one who put it there. All governments have been placed in power by God. They get their origin from the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Ten Commandments that was given to Moses. So those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God. Whoa. So, Rod, when I speed, I have to remind myself, sorry, Lord, because when I break the law, I'm not just breaking the law, I'm offending God. God wants me to abide by the laws as much as I humanly know how to do. And when I don't, to recognize that the law, the government is there because it represents the justice of God. Now, you don't have to tell me about the injustice of the justice system. Okay, I, not only do I have my own experiences, but I have your experiences as well. And I see that human beings struggle to be just in a justice system. I understand that. I understand that a prosecuting lawyer and a defendant that's trying to get out of what they have been accused of doing is asking me questions as a juror to decide if they want to pick me so they can get the verdict they want. I understand that. I understand that there are humans involved in the governmental process. But that does not take away the fact that it is established by God and we are to look to respect and to honor it. Amen? Now, the book of Acts says, should I obey God, excuse me, should I obey man instead of God? There are going to be times in our lives when we do have to disobey government, but we better make sure that we are really obeying God and not just appeasing our own selfish desires. Amen? So there are governments established to deal with criminal issues. That's not what we're talking about today. I'm not talking about abuse. I want to encourage you that if there is an abuse in your life that is of a criminal offense, You should not keep that a secret. You should not hide that. You should not be talked out of being honest with someone in the legal system about the injustices that are being done to you. Amen? So Paul addresses civil dispute. How are we to handle? Number one. This will be the main point and then the rest will be reasons for this point. Take it to your spiritual authority first. Take whatever civil dispute that you're dealing with, take it to your spiritual authority first. And in the case of Vanguard, if you are a member, if you are a part of this church, and you're going to become a member March 17th, uh, you would come and we would connect you to the elders. And the Vanguard elders would get involved in this civil dispute of your life. And if there's a person that is involved that is a believer of another church, then we would get that other church involved as well in resolving this particular issue. Now, the text continues. Look at verse 2. Don't you know that someday we Christians are going to judge the world. And some of us would have to say, nope, I didn't know that. And since you're going to judge the world, can't you decide these little things among yourselves? So why take it to your spiritual authority? Reason number one, because you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, 
We are going to judge the world one day. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says that if we want to reign with him, we're going to suffer with him, but we will also share in his glory. And part of sharing in God's glory is that we will judge the world that we've lived in. You go, well, how will we do that? Well, for one thing, we will be made perfect in his likeness at his return or at our death. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the average human being uses only about 10% of their brain. And we've been around people to know that some don't use that much, right? Amen? So so we've not tapped in, and I wonder, I really do wonder this, and there's no way for me to prove this from the Scriptures, but I wonder before the fall of Adam and Eve if brain capacity was just off the charts compared to now. Like their level of intelligence, like we can't relate to. We can't relate to the brilliance that Adam and Eve had on this earth prior to their fall. And how much of their brain they used, I don't know. It's just my theory. Hear me on this. I can't go to Scripture and prove it. But all of us struggle to use what God has put inside here. And even at 10%, you have to understand, we're still at the top of the food chain, okay? I think the next one is the pig or something like that. Just joking. Actually, I think that's true. Verse 3, don't you realize that we Christians will judge angels? Well, I didn't know that either. Well, now you do. Do you know that the Bible teaches in the Gospels, and it's kind of cool with the uh, dedication today, Carla. The Bible teaches in the Gospels that every child has an angelic being assigned to it. Do you know that every human being has an angel assigned to it? Now, here's a misnomer. When you die, no matter how good you think you are or how good you think your loved ones are, when you die, you don't become an angel. You go, what do you become? What you are, a human with a soul created in the image of God. That's it. Humans do not become angels. There are no new angels being created. Before the world was established, the angelic host was created by God. And somewhere in that process, one-third of the angels, which includes Satan, by the way, Lucifer, and unfortunately, some some Christian religions teach that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. That's not true. That's not true. God, uh, Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is God. Lucifer is an angel, a fallen angel, and he is known as Satan, the serpent, the evil one. And he took one-third of the stars, which is a symbolic reference throughout the Bible, of angels. He took one-third of the angels, and he led them in rebellion against God the Father, two-thirds of the angels still function as guiding angels to our lives. And God has an angel that watches over your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every second, every breath, and every heartbeat. There is an angel that is watching over you. There is a Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And I want you to understand that is the fortress that God has created around you and in you. And one day when this life is over, you are going to judge that angel for the job they did. That's curious. You go, I got lots of questions. So do I. So here's reason number two why I bring these civil disputes to the church, Paul says, because you're going to judge angels. So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disagreements here on earth. But see what the problem was, the early church like us got tired of being screwed over. 
And so they started saying things like this. I'm going to screw you, G, before you screw me. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And they got caught up in money. They got caught up in stuff. Now, I'm sure you've never struggled with that in your life. But they did. And they got so consumed by the, by the accumulation of the stuff of their life that they were willing to forsake all of their existence as an eternal being in order to get their stuff back. It seems we will have knowledge in eternity we don't have now from this passage. So what's the point? And this is the main point of the passage. Be spiritually minded with disputes that involve stuff. Don't lose your soul over your stuff. Don't lose sight that human beings have souls in the midst of you trying to protect your stuff. Do you know what my court case, and I got dismissed, I wasn't picked. You know, you can imagine why, John. I'm sure you, as a lawyer, you understand why you wouldn't pick me. Do you know what the court case was over? The man keyed somebody's car and kicked the side in up. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, we all got to give up our Friday because you can't control your temper. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to life. Like you, you and I have to understand that relationships are not convenient. And we also need to understand that our actions are never lived out in a vacuum. I'm this guy's total stranger, and he took a good portion of my Friday because he couldn't, assumingly, control his anger. That is the world we live in. And I want you to understand something. There is a series of injustices that are going to be true of your life, okay? And if you want to only look through the lens of injustice, pardon my frankness, you're going to spend most of your life pissed off. Amen? You go, I've never amen that in church before. All right. Look at verse 4. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why do you go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I'm saying this to shame you. What? I thought that was bad. I thought we were never supposed to do that. Listen to me. Shame before repentance is always from God. Let that settle over you. Shame before repentance is always from God. Shame after repentance is never from God. Amen? God builds shame into us so that we can feel consequence of our actions in order to love us and help us avoid self-destructing ourselves in the future like we have in our past. But once you ask God to forgive you, 1 John 1, 9, He's faithful and just and immediately forgives you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness. And so if you feel shame for something you've repented of, that's not of God. If you feel shame of something you haven't repented of, that is of God. And I would encourage you to repent today. Paul says, I'm saying this to shame you. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get you not to destroy your life again. I'm trying to get you to hear me. Because you're going back, and I'll show you what he means by this in a bit, but you're going back to the same place that you used to be, but you're using a means of justification to do it. Isn't there anyone in all the church who's wise enough to decide these arguments? But instead, one Christian sues another right in front of unbelievers. So reason number three. Why do we take this to our spiritual authority? Because if we don't, we'll hurt our witness. See, we are here to share the gospel. 
As Charles Spurgeon said, every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. That's it. We are here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Now, you might say, yeah, but I can't be wronged. And I want you to think about this because I find a lot of people, especially after COVID, live like this. Ain't anybody going to ever wrong me again. Boy, that's a dangerous way to live. I mean, that is a dangerous, unhealthy, unproductive, dark way to live. No one's ever going to wrong me again. I have to screw them before they screw me because I've had enough. So Paul addresses this attitude. Look at verse 7. To have such lawsuits at all is a real defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice? What? I mean, the prophet in me says, what? Why not accept the injustice? Because somebody's got to bring justice, and his name is me, right? Why not accept the injustice and leave it at that? <laughs> wow, these are, these are fighting words, right? Why not let yourself be cheated? Ah, oh. but instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and you cheat even your own Christian brothers and sisters. So what's happening in verse 8? They were intentionally looking for people to take advantage of financially through the justice system. They had learned how to work the justice system. Reason number four, you hurt the witness of others. When you and I choose to bypass the church and just go to this legal system and make our stuff more important to us than another person's soul, we hurt not only our witness, but the witness of others. Look at verse 9. Now, don't you know, these are some loaded verses right here. Don't you know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who are idol worshipers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusers, swindlers. You know what a swindler is? A hustler. Yes, with deception. And that's what a hustler is, I guess. It's someone who uses deceptive means to take something that doesn't belong to them. Swindlers. None of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. Now, there was a time when some of you were just like that. But now your sins have been washed away. You've been set apart for God. You've been made right with God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God have done for you. Now, verses 9, 10, 11, I could spend like volumes of time on. Okay, I mean, these are very punchy in the face verses. But let me just point out something to you. Sometimes verses 9, 10, and 11 are used to say something like this. Well, you know, no homosexuals are going to heaven. Oh, okay. Well, then let's read it in that context because I think that's a little unfair just to pick out one here. Uh, those who indulge in sexual sin, idol worshipers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people. Huh. Do we have any greedy people in the house? Uh-oh. Drunkards abusers, swindlers. None of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. The point here is that God had redeemed these Corinthian Christians. But specifically, and what I want to focus on in 1 Corinthians 6 is this. Some of the people in the Corinthian church were thieves, robbers, burglars before they became Christians. They stole stuff from people illegally. And you know what they had decided? And this happens to all of us, by the way. I mean, we all are tempted to put lipstick on the pig of our lives. 
And here's what they did. They said to themselves, we ain't going to be thieves anymore. We ain't going to be burglars anymore. We ain't going to do illegal things like that and steal from people anymore. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the judicial system and we're going to legally steal stuff from people. Huh? That's called justification, by the way. And you know as well as I do that all of us have sin in our lives that we're trying to figure out a way to say, I ain't as bad as I used to be. Okay, and that's true. But we use that as a justification and we look for legal ways to continue to commit the same offenses that we committed before we came to Christ. And I don't know about you, but I know the pet sins of my life where I try to do that, where I try to justify that, where I try to tell myself, this feels like the truth. Okay, well, most of the time you're going to be wrong. You don't need to feel like you know the truth. You need to read the truth. And this morning in my devotions, I was reading in 1 John, and John said, John the Beloved said this, live like Jesus lived. And I just said out loud in the living room this morning, I said, Lord, where in my life am I currently today not living like Jesus lived? And I would encourage you to ask that question. See, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the Word of God is alive. Do you know what that means? It's in real time. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Bible. That's the point. He is the Lagos. And as we live our lives, we, Hebrews says that the Word is alive, it's active. Oh, it's active. So I can say to the Lord, how I treated that person yesterday, was that, were you good with that? Were you good with that? Was it okay that I cut that person? Was, was it okay that I acted that way? Was that okay with you, Lord? And the Lord says, no, not was it? Well, wh what do you want to tell me, Lord? And the Lord's like, what I've been telling you all your life. <laughs> well, tell me again, because I'm a forgetful people. See, it's active. It's alive. It's, it's like a double-edged sword. It pierces to the depth of marrow and bone. You say, what does that mean? It means this. It means that God not only knows your thoughts and your feelings, He can tell you what your intent is. And that's where, where relationship is. And what God is saying to His people is this. Don't take your brothers and sisters to a secular court. Don't get caught up in that. Bring it to the church. Bring it to the church. And before you get caught up in all of that, let it go. 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 You say, well, what if somebody sues me? Well, you better show up in court. Like you don't have a f the freedom if someone sues you in a civil case. You don't have the freedom to say, 1 Corinthians 6. <laughs> well, you do have that freedom, but you also have the freedom to go to jail too. All right? So if someone sues you, you have to go down that path. But let me encourage you. Let me remind you. I'm not talking about criminal acts. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about civil disputes. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And trust that the Lord will bless you for that. Amen? Come on, amen? That's the truth. I hope we can handle it. Let's pray.